am Philippe Girard from the History Department at McNeese State University. And I am Amber Hale from the Biology Department at McNeese. Welcome to Your Grandma Rocks, where we explore the lives of famous women in history. Welcome and bienvenue à nos amis francophones. Ceci est la radio de l'Université McNeese. On the program today, music and history as we retrace the life of a remarkable woman. She was the Queen of France and the Queen of Britain and Duchess of Aquitaine. Her name was Eleanor of Aquitaine. Along the way, we will sample some songs from her two adopted countries, France and Britain, and some breakup songs because she had quite a few of those. But we will start with a French song celebrating the South where she was born. This is Le Sud by Nino Ferrer, which came out in 1975. Qui ressemble à la Louisiane, à l'Italie. Il y a du linge étendu sur la terrasse, et c'est joli. On dirait le sud, le temps du Et la vie sûrement Plus d'un million d'années Et toujours en été Il y a plein d'enfants Qui se roule sur la pelouse Il y a plein de chiens Il y a même un chat Une tortue, des poissons rouges Il ne manque rien On dirait le sud Le temps du Et la vie sûrement Plus d'un million d'années Et toujours en été Welcome back to Your Grammar Rocks. We just listened to The South by Nino Ferrer. My name is Philippe Girard. And I'm Amber Hale. Today we're exploring the life of Queen Eleanor of Aquitaine. How do you say her name in French, Philippe? That would be Eleanor d'Aquitaine. I'll stick with Eleanor. If she was Queen of France, how come she's known as Eleanor of Aquitaine? Because that is where she was born around 1122. Aquitaine is a region of the southwest of France, around Bordeaux, where all the good wines are made. To be honest, speaking of France in the 12th century is a bit of a stretch. The kings of France only controlled a small bit of land right around Paris at that time. So the rest of what we know today as France was controlled by powerful local nobles. And the Duke of Aquitaine alone controlled one third of the country, which was more than the King of France. As the daughter of a powerful duke, Eleanor had the kind of childhood that most girls could only dream of. I'm pretty sure that daddy bought her a pony at some point. Yes, she also learned traditional domestic tasks like embroidery and spinning, 
as well as the skills of a noblewoman, like the harp, but also arithmetic, astronomy, and history. And she spoke a lot of languages. She grew up speaking Poitevin, a local dialect of southwestern France, and she learned Latin, which was the international language of religion and science at the time. And later, she had to learn French and English to communicate with her husbands. And to top all of that, according to her contemporaries, she was quite striking, beautiful, intelligent, full of verve and wit. And her personality alone would have been enough to attract suitors, but as the daughter of the Duke of Aquitaine, she was also the most eligible bride in Europe. Her father had no surviving male heir, so she stood to inherit one third of France. Smart, rich, and pretty. She was the total package. Uh, but she lived 900 years ago, so she might be a bit too old for me. In 1137, her father left for Santiago in Spain on a pilgrimage, but he died during that pilgrimage on Good Friday, April 9th. Eleanor was probably 15 at the time, extremely rich, and she was in great danger of being abducted or worse. So right before his death, her father appointed the King of France, Louis VI, as her legal guardian. King Louis tried to act sad when he heard of the death of the Duke of Aquitaine, but he was really overjoyed. He was now ruling on Eleanor's behalf, a territory bigger than his own kingdom. Within hours, King Louis decided that Eleanor would marry his son. This way, he could add Aquitaine to the French realm. And the king's son, who was also named Louis, traveled to Bordeaux to meet his young bride, and they married in July of that same year. But then, in August, King Louis VI died of dysentery. And so his son became King Louis VII, and Eleanor, still just a teenager, became Queen of France. That was quite an eventful year for her. In a few months, she lost her dad and became Duchess of Aquitaine, and then she married, and then her father-in-law died, and then she became Queen of France. Throughout, she had been handed over from one man to the other like some piece of property. I've always wondered how these arranged royal marriages worked in private. Did they actually like each other? Well, she was not just any young bride. She was cultured, attractive, and a bit sassy. Her husband, the King of France, fell madly in love with her. I guess that's the point where you inform me you have a love song in store for us. You know me too well. It's a princess song too. It's about Cinderella. I didn't know you liked princess songs. Well, it's not one of your classic Disney songs. It's by my favorite French rock band from the 1980s, Téléphone. Look up the lyrics if you get a chance. The song follows Cinderella throughout her life, after the marriage, and the t kids start to take their toll. And so it's a bit more realistic than the Disney version.
Notre Père qui est si vieux, as-tu vraiment fait de ton mieux Car sur la terre et dans les cieux, tes anges n'aiment pas te venir vieux. Welcome back. I'm Amber Hale, co-host of Your Grandma Rocks, a program that introduces you to the lives of important women in history. Today we're talking about Eleanor, the Duchess of Aquitaine, who became the Queen of France in 1137. And I am Philippe Girard. We just listened to the song Cendrillon by Téléphone. It can be difficult to study women of the past because many of them were powerless and had little influence on history. So we tend to study queens and such, but that creates another problem. Many of them were only prominent because they married powerful men. But that is not an issue with Eleanor. She was strong-willed and had a mind of her own. You said she grew up in the southwest of France, near Bordeaux. Did she suffer some cultural shock when moving to her husband's court in Paris? She sure did. I hate to traffic in stereotypes, but there is a big cultural divide in Europe between Northern Europeans who tend to be more reserved and low-key, and Southern Europeans who tend to be more outgoing and even fiery. The line between the two Europes cuts right across France, between Bordeaux and Paris. So she was like a breath of fresh air in royal court that was staid and somber? Exactly. Bernard of Clairvaux was an influential cleric at the court and a bit of a misogynist, and he complained that she behaved in a way that was scandalous for a queen. Sure. They would have liked it better if she had stayed in her chambers cranking out babies. Yes, especially since her first child was a girl, and under French law only sons could inherit the crown. Her independence of mind got her in trouble when her husband Louis got into a war with one of his vassals, the Count of Champagne. Is that where Champagne comes from? That's it. Uh, but uh, nobody was in the mood to party. Uh, that was a brutal war, and at some point King Louis set fire to a town and a thousand civilians who had found refuge in the church were burnt alive. Ooh, how horrible. What did Eleanor do? Well, she offered to broker some peace negotiations to end that war. And I guess the church elders didn't appreciate that she would meddle in politics? No, they didn't. So to defend herself, she meekly responded that she was just being emotional because she had failed to produce a male heir. I have a sense that she didn't believe a word of it and she was just saying it to play off stereotypes. Probably, but it mellowed down her enemies and in the end Bernard of Clairvaux embraced the very peace deal that she had proposed in the first place. That's the kind of clever jiu-jitsu that women had to do for centuries to achieve their goals. Well, her husband, meanwhile, Louis, uh, felt terribly guilty for killing 1,000 civilians in a church. So to get the forgiveness from God, he promised to join the Second Crusade. Sounds exciting. But it's time for another musical break, Philippe. Sure. Uh, we'll listen to a musical by the director Jacques Demy called Les Parapluies de Cherbourg. The talented Catherine Deneuve plays the lead role, and early in the movie, she's heartbroken when the man she loves has to go to war in the Middle East, kind of like Eleanor. Si peu de temps, si peu de temps, mon amour, qu'il ne faut pas le gâcher. Il faut essayer d'être heureux. Il faut que nous gardions de nos derniers moments un souvenir plus beau que tout, un souvenir qui nous aidera à vivre. Nous nous retrouverons et nous 
Welcome back to Your Grandma Rocks on KBYS. I am Philippe Girard. And I'm Abraham. Today we're covering the life of Eleanor of Aquitaine. We just listened to Ne Me Quitte Pas from the 1964 musical Les Parapluies de Cherbourg. The movie is by Jacques Demy, who directed all the great musicals like Podane and Les Demoiselles de Rochefort, all of them starring Catherine Deneuve. I had no idea that there were so many French musicals. I'm more used to a Singing in the Rain and West Side Story. That genre seems to be enjoying a revival right now with the success of the film La La Land. Actually, the director of that movie, Damien Chazelle, is of French origins, and he grew up watching all these French musicals by Jacques Demy. And the tragic end to the love story in La La Land owes a lot to the end of Les Parapluies de Cherbourg, the musical that we just heard. Interesting. But let's get back to Eleanor of Aquitaine. We had just reached a point where her husband, King Louis, was about to go on the Second Crusade. She was not the kind of woman to stay home and wait for her husband's return, so she followed him in that dangerous expedition to the Holy Land. She brought her own knights from the herd duchy in Aquitaine, and she made quite an impression wherever she went. When she stopped in Constantinople on her way to Israel, the Greeks compared her to the Amazons of yore. But the crusade itself didn't go well. The French army was ambushed by the Turks and cut into pieces. Many Frenchmen blame Eleanor for the disaster. Supposedly, she had brought so much luggage and clothes that the French carriage train had been forced to slow down to wait for her, and that had given the Turks an opportunity to attack. Whatever the truth, King Louis managed to make it to Jerusalem to fulfill his pilgrimage, vows, and little else. Her marriage to Louis wasn't going too well either, because she had not yet produced a male heir. Louis also accused her of being too friendly to her uncle during the crusade, and even of having an incestuous relationship with him. So they returned from the crusade on separate ships. The French fleet was attacked on the way back from Jerusalem. Both Louis and Eleanor were given up for dead, but they miraculously survived and reunited in Italy. It was there that they met the Pope and asked him for an annulment. At first he tried to get them to reconcile. Kind of like marriage counseling? Hmm? Kind of. But even with the Pope's help, the marriage did not recover, and they eventually obtained an annulment on the grounds that they were cousins of the fourth degree. Which somehow they conveniently discovered just when they wanted to separate. Yep. I think this calls for a breakup song. I love those. Which one do you have in store for us? I Will Survive? Single Ladies? Everything <laughs> Ever Sung by Taylor Swift? There is a lot to pick from, uh, but I decided to go with Bad Day by Darwin Dees. Thank you. 
To your grandma rocks. I'm Amber Hale. And I am Philippe Girard. We've been retracing the life of Eleanor of Aquitaine, who grew up a Duchess of Aquitaine before becoming Queen of France, going on the Second Crusade, and then divorcing the King of France. We just listened to Bad Day by Darwin Dees, and we heard all the terrible ways that a person can get back at their ex. What did Eleanor have in mind? That was easy. Uh, the main rival of France at the time was England, so she did the most horrible thing she could think of she asked the son of the King of England to marry her. So this time around, she was in charge of the marriage process? Yes. They married in 1152, just eight weeks after getting an annulment from her first husband. Ouch. Her ex must have been mad. Not only was she rebounding quickly from the demise of their marriage, but she remarried to France's main rival. And don't forget that all her lands in Aquitaine now went to Britain instead of France. The British already controlled Normandy since the days of William the Conqueror, so with the addition of Aquitaine, they now control the whole western part of France, more than the King of France himself. That rivalry would eventually lead to the 100 Years' War. We actually have a program scheduled on Joan of Arc, so we'll get to see more about that war later on. As if that wasn't enough, Eleanor finally had the male heirs that she had failed to produce when she married Louis. She had had two daughters from her first marriage with the King of France, she had eight children from her second with the King of England, including five sons. At least she was not related to her husband this time. That would have made sense. After all, she had her annulled first marriage because Louis was a cousin in the fourth degree. But her second husband, Henry, was an even closer relative. He was a cousin in the third degree. Maybe she was trying to have a way out if that second marriage did not pan out either. Maybe. At any rate, her father-in-law died soon after she got married a second time, and so, in 1554, she and Henry became queen and king of England. And that marriage was a bit rocky, too. She was smart and strong-willed. He was a philanderer and 11 years younger than she was, so they had a lot of ups and downs. Three of her sons became kings, and the rest of her children married into the main royal families of Europe. She reminds me of Queen Victoria in the 19th century. She was the grandmother of Europe. You're right. I'd like to take another break and listen to a song by Charles Aznavour called Formidable. It's about a couple where one is French and the other is English, which creates communication problems. The song has a lot of puns and switches constantly from French to English. You are the one for me, for me, for me, formidable. You are my love, very, 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 véritable. Et je voudrais pouvoir un jour enfin te le dire, te l'écrire dans la langue de Shakespeare, my désir, 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 désirable. Je suis malheureux. D'avoir si peu de mots à t'offrir un cadeau Darling, I love you, love you, darling, I want you Et puis c'est à peu près tout You are the one for me, for me, for me, formidable You are the one 
Fanny, 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 formidable. But how can you see me, see me, see me, see me, noble? Je ferais mieux d'aller choisir mon vocabulaire pour te plaire dans la langue de Molière, toi, tes eyes, ton nose, tes lips adorables. Tu n'as pas compris. Tant pis, ne t'en fais pas et viens t'en dans mes bras, darling. I love you, love you, darling. I want you. Et puis le reste on s'en fout. You are the one for me, for me, for me, formidable. Je me demande même pourquoi je t'aime. Toi qui te moques de moi et de tout avec ton air canaille, canaille, canaille. How can I? Welcome back to Your Grandma Rocks. I'm Amber Hale. And I am Philippe Girard. Today we are retracing the life of Eleanor of Aquitaine, who was Queen of France and then Queen of England. Her marriage to King Henry of England was rocky, so much so that she eventually moved back to her ancestral family lands and lived there estranged from her husband from 1168 to 1173. That was the first extended period of her life when she was not under the authority of a father or a husband, and she made the most of it, turning her court into a literary center. Many important genres like courtly love and Celtic epics can be traced back to that court. Apparently, she even set up a court of love where she and other women would sit as judges while lovers came to seek their advice about their love quandaries. Did that really happen? One source says it did, and one of the questions that the female judges had to settle was whether love could exist within marriage. And their answer was? Probably not. She did have some experience on that matter. All of this reminds me of the show you did on French author Eloise. She too was a strong, passionate woman who had some doubts about married life. A good point. Eloise and Eleanor were actually contemporaries and both played a role in the development of the literary movement known as courtly love, which is the ancestor of romanticism. Did they ever meet? I don't think that they did. Eloise was about 20 years older and she left Paris just before Eleanor moved there as Queen of France. Uh, but the husband of Eloise, Abelard, knew Eleanor of Aquitaine. And he actually chastised her for being a bit too independent. That seems to be a theme in her life. Male authority figures chastised her for being free-spirited. Historians have noted that women who had enjoyed some relative independence in the early Middle Ages were subjected to greater male control in the 12th century. And that's why independent women like Eloise and Eleanor had to fight back. And she fought back, literally. By now, Eleanor had been living by herself for years, and she supported her son when he revolted against her husband. To punish her, King Henry sent her to jail. Eleanor endured various forms of captivity for the next 16 years. One thing she had going for her was her longevity. She was much older than Henry, and somehow she outlived him. When he died in 1189, she finally regained her freedom. Ah, another one bites the dust. And that is actually the title of our next song. Was it written for a queen? No, but it was written by Queen. This is Another One Bites the Dust from 1980. Let's go! Steve down the street. Another one bites the dust And another one gone And 
Another one bust the dust. Ow! Another one bust the dust. Hey, hey! Another one bust the dust. I'm Amber Hale. You just listened to Queens, Another One Bites the Dust. And I am Philippe Girard. This is your Grandma Rocks on KBYS. Today we cover the life of Eleanor of Aquitaine, Queen of France and England. When her second husband Henry died in 1189, Eleanor regained her freedom and a lot of power. The next King of England was her son Richard, the Lionheart. He's quite famous today, but in fact he spent a good deal of his reign overseas fighting the French and the Muslims, or in captivity. And so Eleanor ran the country during his absence. Amazingly, she also outlived that king, so she was still alive when John, another one of her sons, became the next king of England. She continued to be active. She even traveled all the way to Spain to arrange a royal marriage with a Spanish princess. Her life had come full circle. She was now the one marrying off young women for political reasons. She was 77 by then, and the trip was physically demanding. On the way back from Spain, she stopped at the Abbey of Fontevraud and took her vows as a nun. And that's where she died in 1204 after a long and full life. And she's still there. You can visit her tomb, which is in a splendid sarcophagus. What an amazing life story. I'm glad we could share it with our listeners. Yes, and we would not have been able to do it without the support of our sponsors. This program was funded by a Juliet Hardner grant for women in the humanities. For more information on how to help finance fellowships at McNeese, contact the foundation at 337-475-475. This program was also sponsored by the History Department of McNeese. To apply for a degree in history or other fields, contact the McNeese Admissions Office at 337-475-5504. Thank you and goodbye. Merci et au revoir. <laughs>